And we are live, people. Good morning, it's Professor Jennifer Harrison Howard's week of your class. Welcome, everybody. It's a beautiful day here in Arizona. We've already hit 100 degrees already. We have this thing, um, this saying back here in Arizona where we have 100, there's a time of the year that we have 100 days of 100 average degree um, weather. So there you go. All righty. So again, welcome. Exam one is gone. It is what it is. Um, I will just say just a couple of loving notes is that um, if you're not comfortable with your drug math, get comfortable with it. You oftentimes will see it on exams. Hint, hint. Um, no, it's a it's a different mindset for your um, for this class because you're not it's not med surgery. Um, you're thinking about the good of of a group of people or the public at large, and so you have to shift your mindset and just keep that in mind as well. Um, Okay, let me just jive in, jump into it. We have chapter 24, 25, 26, um, government, chapter 4, 29, I'm looking at my notes, and 30. So we're going to do a, a few things here today. I'm going to jump into um, this PowerPoint that I have. It's just going to keep us all focused and interactive. And then if we have time, you know, I love my, my case studies and what have you. So then chapter four was rural health. Here we go. Chapter four is your rural health and migrant health. When you're thinking about rural health, you guys, for me, I think of my reservation when I was out, well, I'm still out there <clears throat> working in, with an indigenous group of, of people. There's, um, different and unique challenges that that are faced with um, individuals that um, live remotely or the um, or your farmers or what have you, the different things that they are exposed to. And so just getting into, let me just move this for some reason it's in my way. There we go. All right, you guys. Oh, so, so when when you're thinking about rural health, when you guys were reviewing your chapters, if you're out as a if you're working in a rural health area, just think again. Um, if your rural health could be a community where there's, you know, one one gas station, they're far far from away from like a large. Uh, teaching hospital, emergency room, or specialty care, usually it's a couple of hours away. Um, what do you think? Let me just start with, um, I'll start with Budala. What do you think are some of the pros and cons of rural healthcare and nursing? What comes to mind? What is a, give me a pro. What's in it? What do you think are some good things, positive things about working, um, as a nurse in rural health care. Is Bodala with me? Hello. I see you, Budala. I okay, some of the just um, give me one, give me one pro. I'm gonna move on to other people. If you okay. were a nurse, you're a nurse, you're out there working in on a reservation. What do you think are some pros to being out there? What do you think? Just the head, the head of the care knows the local people, like they associate. Yes, yes, yes. That's the number one thing I have there. You know your patients, okay? And then Letitia. That was what I was going to say. You're going to build more closer relationships with your patients. Okay. All right. I'll take that. I'll I'll take that for, all right, Letitia. And then also too, is that, let me just add that it takes 
time and I'm, I'm I'm actually giving you my real life experience because when you rural rural communities they are close knit they're oftentimes close knit so letting strangers in takes time especially if you look different from them and especially if they're used to seeing people coming and going, coming and going, and in and out, and in and out. I had one of my families, I can remember, because I started 15 years ago, I was like, how long are you going to be here? So there's there's that. And then, so for me, whenever, when I went out there, I remember asking my boss if I could go out with a community help rep, someone that was um, Native American, and they have them. Um, and then, I mean, have them, uh, someone that's Native American, so someone that looks like them, and also they speak the indigenous language. Um, oftentimes there's elders out in the homes, and yes, they speak English, but they, it's the respect of, of you showing up with someone from their culture. It takes time to build trust, but once you have it, it's solid. Another thing that I would do is I would attend the community events, the different um, uh, powwows they would have out there. I would host like a a, a, a table about that talked about um, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which would be primary. <laughs> or um, if I if I knew it was the time of year to where like um, you know we have high rates of um, pertussis. I would do a presentation on what pertussis was and uh, um, whooping cough and that sort of thing. And then you, you get it, but it does take time to, to, to develop that relationship. So Deepa, what would be a con? What would be some of the things that if you were a rural healthcare nurse, that would be um, a disadvantage or yeah, something. That comes to mind. Is Deepa with this? No, that's a, okay. Just put yourself in your shoot. You know, you're out there working in a rural area. What could be a disadvantage or a con that you can think of? Just one thing. I'm sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Um, okay. I would say that you might not have like access to everything since you are in a rural area that like, you know, healthcare benefit and stuff like that is not as uh, vast as in the city area, maybe. Absolutely correct. You have limited resources. And mm -hmm. so you learn to do the most best decision you can with the resources that you have. And again, if you focus on the primary and second, if you can keep people in primary and secondary and away from the diabetes. So then uh, the tribe that I work with, um, they, last time I looked, had the highest incidence and prevalence of type two diabetes in comparison to any ethnic group on this entire globe. So incidents, who knows what incidence is? I know I'm throwing this out and we haven't talked about it, but some people may know. What is, does anyone know what incidence means when you're talking about um, diseases? Anyone wanna guess? Or prevalence? Is it the number of people that have the disease compared to other areas outside of them? Who's talking? I can't see you. Me, Alexis. Tell me about the cases, though. They have the highest um, amount. I'm not sure word. I'm not I, sure. No, no, you're doing good. You're doing good. You're doing good. You're doing good. So, so you have incidence and prevalence. So incidence of diabetes and prevalence of diabetes. Incidence would be new cases, prevalence or existing cases. So then when I talked about COVID, you have, they were like, oh, we have X amount of cases of that were uh, today. And then I don't know about prevalence. Um, I don't know if people are still 
I don't know, that might not be a good example, but um, new, new diagnosis of high blood pressure, people that have existing that blood pressure. So diabetes, they have the highest number of new cases that get diagnosed every year and existing people that are living with the disease. So we're, you're, we're always like trying to prevent new cases from even being existent. Okay, so I deterred for a second. And then as far as Alexandra McDowell or Alex, as Alex, right? What are some of the health concerns that you guys, re you remember reading your chapter about women? Tell me about women um, concerns for this at-risk population. If you're a woman living out in a rural area of Alex, what would be something that would be concerning? I don't know. Nothing's, Nothing's coming to mind. Maybe childbirth. Yes. Yes. Yep. 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 Only because that there's a lack of specialists. So then um, usually in rural areas, you have your, your family practice person or what have you. You don't have like OB people just walking around or neurologists walking around or kidney people walking around. We actually contract and bring in specialists. So that's why when you guys are thinking, again, when you're thinking of we are, you're looking at your you know, exams or doing your case studies or what have you, you, if you can just stay in that primary and secondary and nobody should ever need specialty care, that would be great. But as a woman, you have to look at the fact that, you know, if they have special things that they're needing, um, you just don't have the specialist there. So they actually have to travel, or have villages that are two hours from the nearest hospital. And so that's concerning. What about with, um, what about, um, Manisha, as far as children, what can be what it's children on farms in particular? What would be concerning for you as a public health nurse? Um talked about a little bit in our the previous chapter. I think that was in ch chapter 24. Would it be like access to um, resources that the other people have that they don't have? But like specifically children that are working on farms, I'm switching, I'm switching a little bit to the migrants mm -hmm. because you have to realize that, well, if they're out on the farms, they're like mimicking their parents. They're working from sunup to sundown they're exposed to noise and this, that, and the other. Are they are they getting, do they have time, the parents to get them into being seen by a doctor? Um, what kind of hazards are they being exposed to on the farms as well? Um, and they're growing, so they need, you know, they need nutrients, they need different things of that nature as well. So then when, when you guys are looking into your, um, women and children, they're, they're, they're part of the population that you always wanna keep an eye on because you know women give birth. So then birth rates and what have you, um, if that woman has issues or concerns, if there's not any specialist around, and then the children as well, I mean, they are our future. So you wanna make sure if they're on the farm and they're not in school and they're not getting the, the um, going to pediatricians and getting their immunizations and all of that stuff. These are things that to keep in mind and that they're being exposed to any type of migrant worker. They're being exposed to noises and um, dust and hazards of working with the equipments and what have you that you have to keep in mind for. So these are, I would consider like your, your, your vulnerable population that you just wanna keep a close eye on. And so now let's look into, you're out in this rural community, okay? We, we have this small 
outpatient setting, usually it's these small little tiny little hospitals or clinics. Usually it's a small little clinic, a couple of providers, maybe you'll have a doc in the NP, you may have a one MA for everybody and what else. What are some of the barriers to healthcare in rural areas? So that's a, that's something if you were as a um a public health nurse, these are things, if you were a public health nurse, because they work any, everywhere, public health nurses are not just in the city. Oftentimes they're assigned to different areas out in the counties as well. They go, we go everywhere. And so when you're talking about, when you're thinking about barriers to healthcare in rural areas, just imagine if it's helpful to imagine yourself as living in this rural area and being a patient, that might be helpful. Um, Ms. Gore, what are some barriers that you can think of? Give me one barrier. Cause there's the chapter actually in chapter 24 lists a whole bunch of barriers. Um, yes, one. Yeah. I feel like this is similar to the last one as far as I would say, like just the the access to the technology, depending on the area that you're in. Well, yes and no. So, as a patient, as a patient, okay and you are in a healthcare, if you're in a rural area, you may, I'll give you one. And then, cause the, the book list about 10 that you wanna know is that lack of personal transportation to get to the doctor. Miss Mount, give me another one. Um. I was going to say like the time to get to a healthcare office, because if they're in the rural um, community, it would take time to get there. So if they're in an emergency, I don't know if time would technically be one <laughs> or it's, it's you have to plan accordingly. It's not something that's listed in your chapters, but I I agree with you. They have to, um, they have to plan a little bit more in advance. But then there's there's certain things I'm looking for. Um, Tika, it was limited, in your readings, guys. Um, limited, affordable, reliable public transportation. Yes. Thank you, Miss Murray. Um, people in rural areas might not be so willing to go to the doctor. They have like farmers and stuff. They don't want to take the time to go be seen. Yes, yes. But there's more. I'll take it. Let me let me just let me just ask one more. Lynch. Did I ask anything of you yet, Lynch? Is Lynch with us? There's there no Lynch today. I thought I saw. There you go. I'm right here. Leia. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, I was going to say uh, lack of insurance or um, language barriers. Yes, 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 yes. So let me just say this, you guys. You, you want to know Fox 24-4, and it goes... Lack of healthcare providers and services and great distance to obtain services. So that was good. Personal transportation, cars. They don't have a car to get to the doctor. Unavailable public transportation. There is no city bus. Lack of telephone services. I already know that certain times a month when they're, they're waiting for their checks, that phone is not going to be on. Unavailable outreach services. So if people to actually go out there and provide these outreach services such as presentations and stuff. Inadequate reimbursement policy, policies for providers. That's kind of like, okay, whatever. Um, 
because you know everybody wants to be paid for their services. So that's something, but I wouldn't let that beat me up too much. Weather and travel conditions. I already know that certain times of year, like here in Arizona, we have monsoon season. I don't know if you guys have different flood seasons. I'm not getting past a certain house because there's washes and stuff. So uh, inability to pay for a lack of health care insurance, very good. Lack of know-how to pro procure public funded entitlements and services. So lack of know-how, basically that means that they're not even, some are not familiar with even how to get on these public systems um, to get the services that they need or file for inadequate provider attitudes and understanding about rural populations. And that's for coming in as a new provider, if we're working in a rural area, remember you're a, you're a guest, especially if you're on native lands. And so you don't wanna come in like all native Americans are this, so all people are that or what have you. You just wanna come in, be humble, mind your business, find someone that's been there for a while that can get you oriented Go out when you go out in the community. You want to go out with someone that's been there and established and has their trust, so they can give you "quote unquote" street cred, is what I call it. Care and service is not culturally and linguistic appropriately, which means that you know if I'm in a, a elder's home and and I they prefer to be to have their language spoken to them as far as the education I provide, I need to make it happen. Okay. So did we, oop de oop de oop, okay. Um, so that would be, those are the things you want to know. And then we talked a little bit about migrant workers, what they're exposed to. And the thing that I want you guys to, to, to take away from when they talk about, let me just get to my, to my notes. You know, so migrant workers, they're oftentimes, you know, from other countries. So you, there's the language barrier that's gonna more than often exist. They're working long hours, they're exposed to chemicals. They, um, you're looking at different um, physical ailments like musculoskeletal, back this, back that, skin stuff, dermatitis and what have you. Um, so that's what you want to, to be aware of. You want to be aware that if you if you're working with migrant um, workers, you want to be aware of these things so that you can focus your prevention with that in mind. So then keeping in mind our migrant workers, what they're exposed to, which I just mentioned, okay, the long hours, the chemicals the like, the musculoskeletal, not being able to have the time to not only go to their doctor's appointments or take their children, because oftentimes their children are working, so they should be in school. Um, so keeping that in mind, guys, let's talk a little bit about primary prevention. So if you, you're a public health nurse, you're assigned to work with the migrant workers, and this part of the county, okay? And so, um, Miss Del Cole, Jocelyn, what type of, give me one primary prevention that you may wanna do with, with your migrant workers? Because as always, you're gonna look at primary, secondary and tertiary. So we're gonna go down the line. Primary, we discussed. Education on using sunscreen while they're outside working. Yes, 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 yes. Excellent. Okay. What about um, Ashley Blair Cunningham? What else could we do on a primary prevention focus for these? For, for our population of migrant workers. Just one thing. I'm really unsure. Um, I know education is a big one. Um, but okay. And that's primary. Go ahead. Um, primary is 
before anything happens, it's just trying to educate them, right? Right. Before any disease process happens. Right. Um, and so we mentioned what they, we mentioned, we gave you the scenario of, 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 of what you're walking into. <clears throat> what would you teach? Um, uh, the importance of screening for um, different things. Um, that's kind of secondary. That's secondary. That's secondary. That's secondary. What are we going to do about these pesticides? <clears throat> Can we teach our workers how to reduce? their exposure to pesticides. That's something that we can we can do as well, um, making sure that they have the proper um, equipment, um, proper clothing and that sort of thing. So just think if we know they're exposed to pesticides, we wanna work with the workers, we wanna work with the, the, the farmers or what have you so that they can, what, what can we do to reduce their exposure to the pesticides to begin with? So that's, that's what you're gonna do. That's what you're gonna do. And then <clears throat> secondary, what about, okay, Ms. Brumbaugh, thank you for, for being with us today. Secondary, Mm -hmm. What would come to mind? Secondary, um, I mean, you're going to want to give them the tools for prevention. Mm -hmm. We can do, actually, um, Ashley kind of helped us out a little bit. We want to do some form of screening. We could test their urine for um, pesticide exposure. So then... Right. So screen, so you you mentioned the word, we were just a little bit early on that, uh, Ms. Blair Cunningham, as far as um, screening. So I'm just going down the line. We already know, well, we're aware of the exposure. So then primary, we're, we're educating on reducing the risk so they're not even exposed. That's, that's where we wanna live. Right. We wanna live in primary. And then we can always screen. And let's say we screen, um, it's just screening urine, I believe. Well, you could just screening, screening for, okay, so we know that they're exposed to these pesticides. Okay, let's let's see what we're dealing with here. Let's actually do a screening on our migrant workers to see, see what our numbers are. What are we what are we looking at here? So we've screened. All right. Now we're going to move to tertiary. So we've already screened. We have positive uh, pesticide exposure. And so with that in mind, let me go back to Budala. What would be something that we can do? Because tertiary means, okay, yes, they definitely have then pesticide. We can, we can start to uh, provide the treatments for uh, the people who are exposed. Those are the words I'm looking for. So you guys, no matter what is thrown your way, if you, if you can get a solid grasp, earlier the better, on primary, what that looks like. Secondary, what does that look like? Tertiary, what does that look like? If you, if you want to, like for me, it's so... The tertiary is probably maybe better to grasp because we're already, you guys are familiar, you, you know, you're working in, you're doing your med surge, you're doing your, your peds. So you're working with kids with asthma, you're dealing with folks with UTIs or what have you. So if, if that's better to go ahead and see if tertiary is there, that means there's a disease that's mentioned. So we already know, and he mentioned the key word, so it doesn't even matter. Well, it does matter. If if someone throws out something with tertiary, there's some type of treatment because there's a disease. So you got to deal with it and prevent its complications. So then if we already know that someone um, has uh, tested positive for pesticide exposure, we want to treat the symptoms, which is 
you don't need, I don't think you need nausea, vomiting, and skin irritation. So now you're like, okay, I, in my mind, I'm like, I could have stopped this at, you know, primary. That's where you want to stop. But then, you know, I did a screening and of my 10 workers, nine has um, their tested positive for pesticides. Okay. All right. So, all right, now we got to deal with this. We've got to treat whatever the, the, the symptoms are, the nausea, the vomiting, and you got to just circle back. And again, you're always going to do your education because you got that one that doesn't have the pesticide. So you want to, you know, you want to not make that like 100% of your population. So that's what you want to do. Um, if you think of your prevention from that standpoint, you guys, the primary and the secondary and ter tertiary, you will, I mean, that's, that's the class. So you really want to have a solid understanding of that. And he mentioned the keyword treatment because now they have something and we got to deal with it. All right. Now let's shift a little bit into our two large payers of services, our Medicare and our Medicaid. When I think of Medicare, I, 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 when I look at any of my words, I'm like, okay, how can I make it make sense to me? So when I think of Medicare, I think of caring for the elderly. That's what I think. Um, and then I think of Medicaid, I think of Medicaid as like a band aid, if, if that helps out as well. Um, and so when you're thinking of Medicare, it's a program for 65 or older, um, disabled, um, and then your Medicaid is specifically low income, um, needy children, aged, blind. Um, it's a it's a system that um, are for disabled folks or what have you. Those that are eligible to receive like federal assistance um, income. And then if your Medicaid is um, state-based. So the states actually, if it's available in all the states and financing um, for that with the Medicare trust fund. And so the payment for that is usually from um, financing of um, different revenue, trust fund interest. I'm looking at my notes here, dedicated payroll taxes and that sort of thing. Um, so you want to have an understanding of Keeping in mind your Medicare usually is caring for the elderly. That just, if that's what helps you to kind of differentiate between the two, Medicaid is usually more temporary as a need based um, for those that are in need. And then let me shift you guys to our parish nurses. When you think of a parish nurse, yeah, so these are nurses. Um, that are usually assigned to a congregation, faith-based, uh, faith-based services. If you are working as a parish nurse, uh, Miss Geary, what are some of the qualities that a parish nurse may need in order to care for their community? Um, can you tell me again what the Paris nurses means? So yeah, so it was discussed in our chapters. So it's you know definitely in your readings that you should be familiar with or what have you. So your parish nurse, these are your a special group of uh, community health nurses that are assigned to a um, faith-based organization, um, uh, parish and uh, for their community. They could be with a Lutheran service or Catholic services or um, or the like. So that's usually they're assigned to a congregation or a faith-based. Uh, one quality that they should have would be like to be able to understand that specific population, religion, or culture. Okay. Okay. That yes, we we can take that. All right, Miss McDowell. What comes to mind?
when you're thinking of your um, parish nurses, what are some of the qualities that they need to have if they're working in a, a, a faith-based community? Are you with me, Ms. McDowell? Yeah, um, like open-minded and a good communicator. That's true, yeah. They want to think you you want to look at the fact that you want to consider the whole person, mind, body, spirit, um, when you're looking at disease prevention um, for your faith community. Okay, so there's usually a um, a faith a, there's a faith associated with it. So you're you're not just focusing on the disease. You're both you're focusing on the totality of the person, their wholeness, their mind, their body, their spirit, and how that interacts with um, and how they feel about their disease with their um, with their faith in mind. Um, you want to acknowledge their inner strength. Um, their spirituality comes into play as well with your faith-based nurses. So you want to have that uh, mindset when you're going in. If you're working as a parish faith-based nurse as far as healing and how, how that's connected. Um, you want to, just like Ms. McDowell was saying, you want to be an excellent communicator as well, collaborating, um, collaboration is good, um, and working with um, the congregation. So usually again, and there's a video I'm going to show if you, it's an excellent, it's, short five minute clip, I believe on uh, a, an actual faith-based um, public health nurse that I, I like to share. Um, so that's, uh, again, you're, you're, you're actually, sometimes they're actually part of the congregation. They're members of that, that church. You don't have to be or what have you. So let's just think um, like a large organization like a Catholic social services may hire a nurse for that um, that congregation. And it may actually cover not just the church, but the surrounding community as well, if they're doing outreach or what have you. So keep that in mind. Very good. Excellent, Ms. McDowell. And then shifting a little bit, and we're just doing summaries of our summaries of our chapters here. When you're major in legal issues, in your nursing career, you you may encounter different um, legal and ethical concerns for sure. And so you want to keep in mind um, those that that impact you, such as you nurses are mandated to report different abuse, um, child abuse and neglect, you are mandated to report. And it's, it, it does impact your nursing practice. Um, we are working, if you're working in schools, if you're working with families or what have you, they re most states require, require a nurse to notify the police, um, social services, and any situation that may, um, if you're suspecting uh, a child that's being abused. So just keep that in mind. That's something that was stressed in our chapters or neglect, abuse or neglect. You are mandated to report it. And again, you want to know for your state um, the specifics, like I said, Oftentimes it involves, of course, contacting social services, but you may also need to contact police and what have you. And what's great about nursing is that you're you're not alone, meaning that you're like, how am I going to remember all of this or what have you? There are always, always senior service, senior nurses that are there. You want to find yourself a good, solid mentor as well. Because when you're coming into your nursing career, you're, you're, you know, you're fresh from passing boards and you may think, oh my goodness, mandated reporter, what did she say about this, that? You ask questions, always, always, always ask questions um, and find yourself a good mentor if not one is assigned to you so that you are um, 
you can learn. So yes, yes, keep that in mind. I believe I know our chapters talked about um, suspected abuse, child abuse or neglect. Um, you're mandated to report. And specifically, if you need to contact law enforcement and what have you, that's just a matter of you asking supervisors and finding out what needs to be done. But at the end of the day, not only um, what we should know at this point is it documenting documentation, documentation, documentation um, in everything you do. But we, I think one of our sayings years ago, if it's not documented, it's not done, especially if something of this sensitive nature you always want to document why, because it's it's you don't want it to come back to to um, to haunt you. And so specifically, I wanted to ask, go a little bit about talk a little bit about parish nurses to using their med search skills for mother baby knowledge and their practice. And so I just wanted to kind of touch a little bit on that as well because again your your you you can use your med search you will use your med search skills and knowledge when you work in um as a public health nurse and as a parish nurse as a school nurse you know we talked about school nursing these are all um subset specialties of um public health, population health, or what have you. But specifically for mother and baby, you when you go out and do your assessments, um, keep in mind these are two of your vulnerable population groups as well, your, your, your moms and your babies. So you want to make sure that you they, that their postpartum care, you want to make sure that you're looking for signs of um, any complications with breastfeeding and what have you. So then if you're in a home, again, you have this vulnerable you vulnerable group. So you want to make sure that mom and baby are both recovering and um, babies getting the care that they need. They, you've connected them, especially if you're in a rural area with pediatricians and getting the vaccines that they need. That's in, in their well child visits on scheduled or what have you. So that's the thing as, as whether you're a parish nurse or school nurse, you're doing a lot of case management and coordination. So remember, mom just had a baby and, um, uh, you know, and then your newborn as well. There's certain things they need at certain times. So you're coordinating and making sure that they're getting things done. You're not doing everything yourself. You can't. You have a, it's a collaboration team approach. But just keep that in mind as well. So when you're thinking of parish nurses, um, if you were a parish nurse and you're working out um, with a, a congregation, what would be some, an ethical issue that may come into practice? Uh, Tika, what, what comes to mind? Um, setting up a boundary with the patient, I guess. I'm sorry, say, I didn't hear you do. Like setting up of boundaries with the patient. Okay, yes, 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 okay, we can do that. Ashley Blair Cunningham. Is any so ethical? with ethical, is that like a belief? Ethical may be something to where your your concerns, um, your belief systems um, could be challenged. Like um, for certain populations, like um, where they um, believe like the woman is a homemaker and should be cooking, you know, or doing stuff that is like supposed to be a, technically a man's job. Okay. Okay. We'll take that. Miss Delay, what comes to mind? Uh, for parish nurses, maybe their beliefs don't line up when it comes to ethical issues like abortions or thank preventative you. care. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And so let's take that a step further, Miss Gore. 
I think I've already called on Ms. Gore. Let me go to Ms. Mount for a second time. So let's just take it a little bit further. So some ethical considerations and Ms. DeLay mentioned, um, we won't touch on it too much. If you're challenged with uh, an ethical concern, how would you, as a parish nurse, what, what might what might you do? Um, well, I know like when dealing with faith, you kind of have to understand your own faith um, before you go and work with other people's. And you kind of have to have like what Alex said before, an open mind. Like you can't, you can't judge. You want to make sure you're not showing that judgment with the patients. Um, and you may not believe in it. And we're going to come in contact with that a lot in our practice. Mm -hmm. um, but it's what the patient believes. It's yes. what they want. So you have to keep that in mind. It's your patient. You're caring for your patient and what they need or want. So you can't put yourself in that situation because you're caring for them, not yourself. So keep exactly. yourself. Exactly. And it's not your, yeah, it's not your judgment. Not for us to judge, pass judgment, think what we believe is best for them. Um, ethical concerns will, it will happen in nursing, you guys. And just like Ms. Mount was saying, you have to know where you stand yourself so that when you go in, you're not consciously or subconsciously putting your beliefs on others and what they should do. And that goes with, again, when you're making, helping, when you're prov providing information for informed choices, it's their choice. And you're presenting the information, not in a way that you're trying to coerce or what have you. They need to have this surgery. They need to do this, that, and the other. They need to have dialysis. Why are they stopping dialysis? Don't they know that they're going to, you know, you know, their toxins are going to build up and they could die and et cetera. It's not your decision to make. It's not your life or what have you. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So let's shift a little bit, you guys, and talk about home health and hospice. How are they similar? How are they different? Does anyone want to volunteer to tell me what's the, uh, how are they similar? They're both taking care of a patient in a home setting. Was that Ms. Nickerson? Yes, ma'am. Hi, Ms. Nickerson. Hi. It could be home. They both focus on the whole family. That's true. They do. Who wants to give me some more? They're both under public health and community oriented. Um, the home health is more uh, med surge like, but 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 they both can can take place in the home. I was a hospice nurse for a minute of time way back in uh, late nineties. Um, actually was a hospice nurse, um, and I, uh, and I was assigned to the nursing homes and assisted livings. That was their home. Home health is at home. <laughs> is, is, um, if they're in a nursing facility and I want to take it down a different road, then, you know, it's something else, but they're in a the nursing facility. And so then how... Let's talk a little bit about how are they different, Ms. Myers? Um, hospice is more, we, hospice is more so like when you're, um, their illness is no longer able to be treated. So you're just managing like comfort and home health. You're working to recover like an injury or an illness and progress. Yes, 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 yes. absolutely. Absolutely. So that's you. You have your 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 post op patient that's recovering at home, needs an additional um, nursing care at home. There's a team of folks. Um, that's how they're okay. They're similar because um, 
you're you're caring for the patient outside of the traditional hospital setting. Um, home health, usually, like I said, is more of recovery from an injury. You're helping to rebuild them back up to par as it will. You'll have usually your nurse that comes in and then um, a home health uh, aid, maybe the help with the ADLs, like your bathing and that sort of thing. You may have OT and speech or, or OT that may come out. Physical therapy is also another popular or uh, uh, for uh, that's part of the home health team. Let's just say they're recovering from a uh, knee surgery or what have you. Um, so they can you can have physical therapy at home to help you with restorative exercise and then that sort of thing. Um, and then your hospice, your hospice is the you have to meet criteria for hospice, well, you have to meet criteria for both for home health because it has to be reimbursed and that sort of thing. But for hospice specifically, um, I know in our state, it's a terminal, you have a diagnosis of a terminal condition uh, where the natural progression of the disease, if carried out, um, uh, has less than a, a year uh, um, prognosis. You can, I have known folks to graduate out of hospice, only to come back in, you know, a little bit later or what have you. And that's perfectly fine as well. Um, your focus for your, your, your hospice nurse is end of life care. Um, you're not providing things that will, um, there's more comfort. So you, you won't see IVs. Uh, IV fluids, if they're dehydrated, you're educating the patient and the family on um, how, you know, mom or dad will um, slowly maybe lose the ability to swallow. They may not urinate as much. And so, you know, to educate them and not rush to put in the IV or something because mom is dehydrated is part of the, the process of the disease. So it's comfort and um Hospice can, again, I, hospice is traditionally at the home. Yeah, it can be. It's whatever their home is. Um, if that patient is in the nursing home and, and they were diagnosed with breast cancer, a hospice nurse, because that floor nurse that's working with that patient is not a hospice nurse. So you need that specialty care. And she may come in to visit the patient once a week in the nursing home or wherever their home is. Um, and then I remember one of the things that we were required to do is be there for the, for the death experience. And so if, if we get called out by the family or if you're in the nursing home and you get a call out and Miss Smith is, I think this is, she's getting close. We come out and do the assessment and we, we are there there's nurses are 20 on a call 24/7. We we are there for the death experience. We are as they're taking their last breath. That's what hospice is all about, being there with you until the very end. And so I think we cover a little bit about the types of priority things um, to consider, but let's just kind of go into it a little bit. Whenever you're um for the the home health nurse, you're always gonna do your um you're always going to do your assessment where, where, wherever you are, whether you're in home health or whether you're in hospice or what have you. But things to consider is, um, I'll just go ahead and just talk about, you want to always, again, prevention, prevention, prevention. You're looking for signs of, um, of anything, I guess, infections, complications, you're trying to prevent complications, whatever it's being dealt with. So I know for my mom, when she was on hospice, um, we got her a special bed, air mattress, um, or what have you, and um, make sure that we have home health there to help with bathing, help turn her, prevent decubit eye, and what have you. You want to be, you want to identify anything and prevent complications, prompt treatment. So then, when you're doing your, you're you're looking for early signs of any type of um, new health problem. 
if that makes sense. So you do your, I know you're thinking like, oh, but it sounds like med surgery. You're, you're always going to keep med surgery. You're going to always use it. Like if I'm going out as a public health nurse on a reservation and I see something, you know, I can take care of it or identify, well, I can notify the proper doctor, or nurse practitioner, or what have you. I'm not going to say, oh, it's not part of my education today. So you're always are going to um, look for signs of, of infection and prevent complications and, and that sort of thing and maintain the highest level of, of health and self-care. So then you want to, if that hospice person wants to hold their cup, their can of Ensure, you know, you don't have to spoon it to their mouth. If they can hold it and 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 take sips while you monitor them, then let them have that independence. And and um, if they're able to assist with with any of their activities as well, so you just want to keep that in mind. Um, if you see anything, you want to jump on it right away. Notify the appropriate people. Prevent bed sores and complications and that sort of things. Because again, if you got somebody on hospice or home, somebody that's bed bound, you already should think in your mind if they're always in the bed because they're not able to walk and that sort of thing. You don't need a doctor's order to turn a patient off their side and instruct the care workers. And you know, mom needs to be off her side every couple of hours, turn her from this, that, and the other pillows. Um, lotion her heels, float her heels, that sort of thing. Um, not everything requires a doctor's order, um, making sure that, you know, he, the bony promises off the bed. So anyway, prevent, prevent. And remember that you're, you're not alone in all of this. It truly does take a village. And one thing I loved, love, love, love about um, being a, a public health worker on a reservation is that, um, once they accept you into their village, it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. And that you're not, you have, a, you gather your resources, you start writing down names and phone numbers of, you know, I have the number in my phone right now, the, the director of the WIC, little WIC office. If I see that Ms. Smith um, wasn't able to make it in for her WIC recertification and that sort of thing. So it does take a village and you guys, um, it's a beautiful thing. So then there's a couple of other things I just want to share with you to um, kind of help us with understanding a little bit of the concepts here. Let me see if I can find it. And keep in mind, if you need to take a break, just type in your chat box, um, go in the bathroom, and then type when you come back. Um, we agreed to just go straight through and, um, there we go. Okay. So let's see if I can pull it up here this morning. All righty. Let me see here. Everyone, I'm looking at Budala. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Can you guys hear it? Oh, la, 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 la. Can you guys hear it? Yes. Okay. I'm going to stop talking. Yes. For a second. <laughs> now make sure you keep that bandage dry this time, Billy. I'll see you on Thursday. Hi there. I'm Nurse Jane with Active Home Health Hospice and Personal Care. I often get asked from family, friends, and neighbors. What is home health and what are the services it provides? Home health services are designed to restore and improve an individual's health condition or level of function. We focus on restoring a patient's active lifestyle and independence, all the while helping them remain in their home. Preventing hospitalization or admission to long-term care institutions. Active home health nurses like myself manage each individual patient and create a unique custom care plan for everyone. Using one or more of the following focuses, we observe and assess. When a patient's condition has changed or is likely to change, we work with their doctor to make adjustments and ensure the adjustments have the desired effects. These include managing abnormal vital signs, weight fluctuations, 
medication adjustments, behavioral changes, and more. We teach and train patients or their caregiver on the disease process and how to manage the treatments appropriate to their functional loss, illness, or injury, including gait and transfer technique training, IV management, ostomy teaching, diabetic teaching, and many other disease-specific training. We also administer medications. When a skilled nurse is necessary to safely and effectively administer the medication for the treatment of an illness or injury, such as IV infusions, injectable antibiotics, vitamin B12 injections, insulin injections, and more. As your nurse, I enlist the help of my team members to provide other non-nursing services, such as physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, CNAs. Our home health services have been used to help thousands of people with their health conditions, ranging from COPD, heart failure, fall risk prevention, joint replacement, strokes, Parkinson's, wound care, Alzheimer's, UTIs, and so much more. Now that you know a little bit about home health services, give us a call at Active Home Health Hospice and Personal Care today to find out how we... Did you guys see the number of different diseases and conditions that was listed there? Parkinson's, stroke, what have you. So when you think of your home health, restorative to where they can stay in home, you're preventing them, you want to prevent from re-hospitalizations. Uh, they bring the services to you, your physical therapy, your CNAs and what have you, all within the comfort of your home. So that's what, think of that as your, that's your home health. And then let's do, let's talk a little bit about the I hospice. Don't want to go to the hospital again. I don't want to go to the hospital again. We understand and have other options for you that don't involve going to the hospital. Hello friends, it's me, Nurse Jane with Active Home Health Hospice and Personal Care. I was just meeting with Lucia and her family to discuss our desire to no longer go to the hospital, but rather stay in the comfort of her own home. The good news for Lucia is that there is a free alternative approach to end of life care. This approach is called hospice care. What is hospice care you ask? Hospice care is a comfort care approach to caring for an individual with a terminal illness. At Active Hospice, we approach hospice care with three main intentions. Let's take Lucia, for example. We will ensure that Lucia will have a better quality of life. We will help her and her loved ones avoid a prolonged dying experience and attain a sense of closure and understanding. We focus on quality over quantity of life, providing lasting memories and more enjoyable moments. We will... Oh, you guys, I'm so sorry. We will also give Lucia control over her end-of-life experience. Along with her loved ones, Lucia will choose how and where she spends her precious time. As Lucia mentioned earlier, she wants to remain in the comfort of her home, surrounded by those she loves, doing what makes her happy. Instead of seeking curative treatments in the hospital or a rehab facility, we will focus on giving Lucia comfort care. We want her to be as comfortable as possible. No painful procedures, tests, or countless hours of rehab focusing on a cure, just symptom management and pain relief. Lucia's loving care team will help Lucia with personal care, assist in making sure all of her needs are met, planning for end-of-life care, and ensuring her and her family have peace of mind. We will provide her with comfort medications, medical equipment, and supplies. After Lucia has comfortably passed away, our services will continue helping her loved ones with counseling and therapy, coping mechanisms, support groups, and so much more. I always stress that the hospice discussions should not wait until the last few days before death. It is important to access the benefits of hospice care as soon as possible. I frequently hear families say, I wish we would have started these services sooner. Don't wait. If you or a loved one could benefit from hospice care, give active home health again okay and have other options and then one more you guys are doing great as soon as i can figure out unemployed everyone can see dp okay james dobson's high blood pressure was life-threatening shortly after karen houston's husband suffered a nearly fatal brain aneurysm her daughter was diagnosed with diabetes. Unable to sustain her oxygen levels, Lily Jaquetti spent more than one month in the hospital. 
Though these people were dealing with devastating illnesses, they did share one advantage. They each turned to their parish nurse for support. Across the country, parish nurses practicing the specialty of faith community nursing are improving public health by reclaiming the historic roots of health and healing. This is your bubbler. How often do you change the water? I have to change it every day. When Mrs. Lily Jaquetti was hospitalized for nearly a month, oh, yeah, well, parish nurse you. Ramona Davis made daily visits. My illness was really serious, and uh, everybody knew it. I visited with her. I um, uh, followed up and explained a lot of tests that she was um, required to get that she really didn't understand. When she was ready to be discharged, I made sure she had her equipment. Um, she had uh, visiting nursing. She had her oxygen okay. set up. 128 over 70. That is really good. You are doing such a wonderful job. Yeah. There are a lot of churches in our neighborhood, but there's only one parish nurse. And people will come in, they'll leave other churches and stop by to see Ramona. I wonder how in the world I could have done ministry without a parish nurse. Um, so I'm gonna give everybody a, a handout. Ramona's duties range from assisting the critically ill to supporting church activities and promoting wellness. I do a lot of health teaching with the kids from the school and the confirmation kids at the church. So we're going to look at it from a religious standpoint. We currently have a gospel aerobics class, which is intergenerational. We get to interact with people on an everyday basis. If there's a change, you notice it. How was your blood pressure the other day? Okay. It was uh, 135 over 85. Oh, goodness. You have these long relationships with people. Okay, take a deep breath. I've known some of the people that I care for now a good part of my life because this church is where I was raised. <laughs> these long relationships enable parish nurses to treat the body, mind, and spirit. When Karen Houston discovered her husband had a brain aneurysm and her daughter was a diabetic, she questioned her faith and her ability to cope. I, I thought I was going to pass out. You know, I think I had to have some place to sit down. I probably would have had a nervous breakdown with Michelle. Mm -hmm. Nurses do have one step in the sciences and one step in the humanities. Um, and I think parish nurses also have that other step in the spiritual through this holy anointing. May God's love for Christians and so, you know, to have someone who I could relate to on that level and could offer that support and prayer and that kind of thing just help, get, help me get through a very difficult time. I firmly believe that the spiritual side of health is a very important aspect for, for people at any time, even when they're seemingly healthy. Parish nursing is in a position to really bridge and look at both the physical health and the spiritual health of, uh, of people in the community. In communities with few resources, parish nursing is a critical life learning. Joe no, Jawinski connects people to the resource they need to regain their health. The needs here are really overwhelming. I often think of this parish nurse ministry as being, if you think of it in terms of hospital nursing, that this is the intensive care unit here. You know, if you see someone with a terribly high blood pressure, you think, oh, that must be the problem. Well, it is the problem, but that person may really want a pair of clean pants.
James Dobson hadn't been to the doctor in years. He was shocked to discover he had high blood pressure, and he was reluctant to take the medication because he feared the side effects. As time went on, his blood pressure was literally going up and up and up. To him, still in my mind to, you know, like take the medication every day. So on some days I forget, and then like an image of Joe jumps up and hey, he back upstairs, I go to get my medication. We averted a stroke for him because his blood pressure was quite high. It's surprising sometimes how much sodium is in the canned goods. So with our parish nurses, we have an opportunity to act on those illness prevention uh, opportunities and prevent individuals from being seen in the emergency room or having to be admitted to the hospital. So it's a wonderful way of promoting health and containing health care costs and also uh, fulfilling our, our faith-based calling. You're happy and you know it wants to come. All right, let's see who can do all four here. Parish nurses are involved with community activities that range from preschool classes to women's support groups. The movements are scripture and meditation and then sharing. Parish nurse Deb Stankowitz first met Sharon Cohesi 10 years ago when her children attended Deb's health education classes. The long-standing relationship between Deb Stankowitz and Sharon's family proved itself indispensable when tragedy struck. I found out that I had a hole in my heart and breast cancer through one phone call from my doctor. So I had three surgeries in one month. Parish nurses empower people to get the information they need to make informed decisions about their health. And when I knew she was going for the appointments, um, I just called her, keeping in touch and offered, you know, if you would like, I'll be happy to be with you in those appointments to be a second set of ears because you are absorbing a lot of information at one time. Like, and then family history might be a piece of this that she should consider yeah, because she does have a common and hand. Deb's such a wealth of information. Um, and to have her along at the visit, she could ask questions that didn't ever occur to me to ask. I do think uh, to have a nurse in the church that can help you to sort things out is a great resource. Our earth is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. As America ages and healthcare costs spiral, parish nurses are becoming an increasingly valuable resource to communities and congregations across America. When we surveyed uh, our congregation before we embarked on the $3 million capital campaign, the thing that our parishioners told us that was most important to them was the parish nurse. I think all churches parish nurses. All right, you guys. So let me just make sure let me stop sharing, but it's still. Hang on one second. Let me figure out. Okay. All right, you guys. Okay, let me get you back. All righty. Parish nurses, prevention, working with the community. That one gentleman who he said, as soon as I forget my blood pressure medicine, I think I have, I get Joan's face or comes into mind or what have you. And so they build that relationship. So when you think of your faith-based nurses, of course you think church, church, mosque, temple, whatever that faith might be. When you have that medical person, that nurse that's involved in that community, that temple, that church, that school, 
that reservation, that one person, wherever you want to put her, you could put her in the village, you can put her in the schools, you could put her at the, the work site, and we'll talk about um, um, uh, nurses that work in like um, an industry and what have you. One thing you guys will realize, and I don't think we'll have time to get into our, our case study because I like to talk, but, and it's, and it's perfectly fine. I always like case studies because it's just, I don't know, I have case studies for my case studies. They're just an excellent way to do, to um, just hone in the concepts. But just if you, if you, if you get the preventions in your mind and what they truly are, if you can think of whichever one is easier for you, for me, if there's just a disease is already tertiary, I know I keep drilling that head, no matter what somebody throws at you, it's still going to be tertiary. They have it. Now you got to roll up your sleeves and try to prevent stuff and treat stuff and what have you. And then um, secondary, you're looking. So the S is surveillance, screenings, surveys, just like when they... Um, uh, okay. So yeah. And then primary, like, again, when you saw those parish nurses out there teaching and handing with the, the school kids and then the, the exercise with that, that the aerobic exercise they were doing to the gospel music, that's primary prevention right there. You know, you can, and you're like primary prevention of what? Anything that exercise can help. You can throw it in. You can make it focus on whatever you want you want it to be for that exercise because exercise helps high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity. So you can, you know, however you want to do that. Do you guys, I know you have other things lined up for today. I'm going to open it up to any questions that you may have. Any questions? No, yes, maybe. Any questions on anything? Anything at all? Yes. yes, Budala. Yes, can you talk more about the, the assignment, about the case study we need to, I saw like you told us to choose a topic, something like that. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. So um, you're talking about the infectious disease one? Let me make sure, because there's a lot of assignments. Uh -huh. What are you talking about? I think that's the one. The infectious disease one? Yes. So you you choose you choose a topic that's um you can choose some people choose tuberculosis, some people choose um influenza, um any disease that's infectious that can be spread to um by by air through through respiratory through droplets i'm pretty flexible with it you wouldn't want to choose like dermatitis okay this is not an infectious disease and you want to choose something always choose something that's of you know you send me a, a just to send me like a, a a contact this is what i want to do and i'll say yes approved um or what have you i don't want too many people like doing the same thing or what have you um but yes yes in that way that because you know the 12 weeks go by so quickly so we're touching on this you're touching on that and this is a way that they touch upon infectious diseases by having you to to do a project on that um and you can always like look in your text or what have you try to find something that remotely interests you it might might help you know this measles pertussis and that sort of thing so I would stay away from COVID. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you can if you want to be bold, but it's still new. People are still writing papers and stuff. So okay. yeah. are those the same um, groups from the first project? You stay in your groups. I mean, like I said, when we're in class, I'll randomly assign, like I had a case study that just talked about, you know, child abuse and mandated reporting, but um I always have case studies because they're great for fillers, but the, the long answer to your question is yes, you're always going to be in your group, always, 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 anything group related, so you guys always reach out early, everybody has to, you know, be in agreement, it's a group, and so 
everyone submits their project. That's, uh, I don't, that's a Canvas thing or something. It's not a Harrison Howard thing. Yeah, everyone has to submit and you have to submit it by Wednesday. So people have things to respond to. Um, and then you guys, thank you for bringing that up, Alexis. Let me just, you know, I love the talk. And so you posting it is not, that's great. You'll get, you get a lot of points necessarily, but you, you want to, you, you know, every little thing counts and you want to respond and your responses matter. They have to, they have to, I mean, okay. All right, here we go. So a complete sentence is three sentences. You got to at least have three sentences. They got to add value to it. Like I don't micro pick it, but it's like, okay, Alexis, great post. Mm, okay. All right. That's, that's one, but you got to tell me something. And if you're, and if you're, um, if you're, if you're, you're getting information from someplace else, you got to cite it. You know, you got to tell me where you're, you're getting it from, you know? So if you're giving me your opinion, then I'm like, okay, then that's Budala's opinion. That's fine. But the opinion's got to make sense too. But, but, but you want to, you know, I give you some credit for, for, for trying but but just you know keep in mind like again if you're talking about tuberculosis you know i'm not a tb expert so i'm going to cite cdc all day long and um because it's not me cuz but you know i'm women's health and ob gynecology is my specialty i can probably start, rattle off some stuff and not need to cite it but i've been doing it for a long 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 time so you guys being students, most of your stuff should be cited because you're students and you're learning. And you got to tell me where you're getting your learning from. And it's not wiki. You want to do CDC, who, health departments, um, that sort of stuff. Because just think about it. What you're you're telling me is that, you know, you're getting your information for some place that I trust. And then that information, if you're going to use it for a patient, you wouldn't want to, you know, have somebody's say something that that's going to, um, that you're gonna use on your mom that came from Wiki. So, you know, just keep that in mind. Uh, what else, what else did I notice? Um, everyone did a really, really good job with your, um, with the, let's talk about the discussion questions. Um, get your, I'm just an early person because I never know what's gonna happen in my life. And I have kids and I have families and I have side jobs and all that kind of stuff. So I'm just like, it makes me nervous when I don't, I just like to post early, just get it out of the way. You know, as if you have a spare moment, like someone mentioned earlier in the first day of class, like, can you work in advance? Oh yes, you can. Um, you, you may not be able to post it. Like for me, when I was in any of my when, degrees, I don't know where we had discussion questions and stuff. You can, if you're able to look and see what this question question is, you can write it up, put it in a Word document, save it, and then post it when you need to post it. And it's nice and pretty. You don't have to do everything the exact same day you're gonna post it, you know? And then if you start seeing, if you see somebody's response, I mean, if you see someone, let's just say Letitia um, is looking at Alex's um, case study, then you can certainly, while you're in clinical during downtime, kind of start working on it. You don't have to like sit there, like do it right this second. You can start, you know, little things here and there and what have you. Um, but people will, you'll, you'll lose credit if you don't respond. And it's like at the end of the class, you, you end of the semester, like, oh, I just needed a couple more points. So just do everything. I mean, the total thing is like 20, what's 20 points or other case studies or what have you. You want it, you want it all. You want it all, all of it, all of it. Um, so it, it's, it is possible for one person from the group to have a higher score because like, A, they responded to, they did the responses and their responses had more stuff in it. I don't need a book. I just need to know that you're responding to um, Badala's about tuberculosis and 
you know, it's important for this, that, and the other because this, that, and the other, and this says this and that and something. Give me something. Give me some meat and potatoes. Questions? Questions, questions, questions. Um, I've mentioned this before. If you can, you really do want to try to attend. I'm going to beat this word down. A live um, exam review. If time allows, and I never want to promise, I can sometimes add in a couple of minutes of um, in the class, but then I actually have an official exam review, but I can never promise you guys I'm going to be able to do that because the class is supposed to be about the class, not the exam review. I've known people in your class, and I'm not going to mention any names that attended more than one live review because we get a list of people that attended the reviews not for better or for worse, but just, you know, because we have it. And I'm like, okay, this person attended a couple of live reviews and he got an A. Now, did that have anything to do with it? I don't know. I like, I had people from Florida, from my home state in my exam reviews. And it's like, oh, I like yours. I'm going to come back to yours. And it's like, well, you're probably thinking, well, you can listen to a recording, but live is different. Just like I was saying somebody earlier, you know, live Michael Jackson and recorded Michael Jackson, I'm quite sure was quite different back in the day. I would rather have a live Michael Jackson than a recorded Michael Jackson. May he internally rest in peace. And then you can ask your questions. And so as I was doing my reviews, if you listen to my reviews, people ask questions, but if you're listening to it later, it's too late. And then it's different when you're in a spur of the moment, you can be like, oh, what does that mean? Uh, uh, what does that mean? And it's just it's just different. But again, that's 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 recommended. It's not required of you. And then listening to more than one professor's lecture is good. If you can't make it because of life, then I always when they when the professors send them to me, like I'll have students to say, "Can you see me for Dr. Lynch?" I'm like, "Well, when Dr. Lynch sends me to me," <laughs> and then I. I posted that when I get it. So try to listen to as many of them as you can over and 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 over, and over, and over again. Uh, even if you just put a bud in your ear and you're just, you know, walking the dog or what have you, nobody knows what you're listening to. You could be, they could be thinking you're listening to Metallica. I don't know. Um, and then you want to be like, you, you got to do your drug math. And I can't promise you, but I can almost promise you, you see, you're going to see drug mouth. You're just going to see it. You're probably going to see it again. And so you, you, that's just you practicing over and over and over and over and over and over, 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 over. I mean, get out some medicine from your cabinet and like figure out if there's Tylenol 500 milligram tablet and you want to give 250 milligram tablet, you might already know what you're going to do, but actually write it down how you would give yourself that tablet. I don't know. Or, um, but that's just practice and repetition. All right. So that concludes our lecture for today. I'm going to hang on to talk to anybody that wants to talk to me. Thank you guys for being awesome. Um, yeah, we'll see you same time, same place next week. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just ask you a quick question about you the, may you the may project? Huh? <laughs> the the week nine, the vulnerable population project. Oh girl, you looking that far ahead? You're killing well, me. Yeah. <laughs> No, go ahead. What's your question? I'm sorry. Uh, well, no, just so what is it? I read the rubric, but what is it exactly? Are we supposed to be doing the paper and the PowerPoint? You just just a PowerPoint, PowerPoint, just a PowerPoint, just a PowerPoint. Never a paper. I don't think we have a paper paper. Well, I've had some in the past okay. online that wanted okay. kind of let me Let me give you an example. So you pick a vulnerable population and it's a PowerPoint. And if you just pull it, so it's no paper. That would be like torturous, wouldn't it? Towards the end. So um, you print out the rubric. And if I were you, every slide, everything they ask for would be a slide. Okay. At least a slide. And if it tells you that they want X amount of slides, I mean, like literally, I'm not being funny. Like 
I, when I do stuff, I don't even look at y'all's names. I just look at the rubric. Does she have this? Does she have this? I'm like a robot, you know? Mm -mm. You know, I don't like try to like take away points, but it's like some, I think they ask for a certain number of slides. I'm like, just create that number of slides, you know, blank, and then fill this it out. One, this one said a maximum of 10. Yeah. And I know you need like a title page and your reference page. So I don't, I don't, let me, let me, um, Hang on one second. 